Good morning, everybody. We got there. It's Friday, the end of the week. We got through all the central banks, uh, hopefully unscathed. Um, got a special guest today as well. Mr. Michael Brown is with us from Pepperstone. Um, Stelios is uh, off this morning as well. So good morning to you, Michael, and morning, K-Man. Morning, mate. Am I the uh, replacement for the uh, for our friendly Greek friend as he's sunning himself somewhere? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, substitute uh, made this morning. <laughs> are you doing all right, mate? <laughs> I'm good, mate. I'm good. Happy it's Friday. How are you? Yeah, it's about the same. Yeah, happy it's Friday too. Yeah. Uh, morning, Kay. You all right, mate? Hey, Ryan. Hey, Michael. Welcome, mate. Um, I'm uh, looking forward to this one. Yeah, so uh, what was the name of the uh, Super Sup again? Uh, in uh, and what was that Liverpool in the, in the earlier days? They had Super Sup every time he came on. Uh, there was uh, he scored goals. What's his name again? Oh, Strachan. No, wasn't wasn't Fowler, was it? When he got old? No, was it Strach Gordon Strachan also? Oh, Gordon Strachan. Oh, that's going back a bit. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, he's, he's <laughs> back. Hey, don't forget that I was there. <laughs> <Those years. laughs> I think uh, everything was black and white in those days. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, oh uh, yeah, there we go. Great love. David Fairclough, there we go. Blimey, there that's we going go, back. Oof, really going back with that one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, enough about Liverpool. We don't want to talk about Liverpool, considering uh, Mike's an Arsenal supporter. Oh, uh, well, can we can we just avoid football all told? I'm quite enjoying uh, the no, off-season. I can, I can chat a little bit about <laughs> Man City, if you like. Yeah, oh. hand, hands up if you've won a trophy this season. Me, me and Kay have got our hands up. So, I'm off. Yeah. I've, I'm done. I've enjoyed the call. Thanks for the invite, Jen. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Right. Well, we've got lots to talk about, so let me get stuck into it and uh, we'll get through all the headlines and uh, we'll talk about the central banks and whatnot. Uh, starting over in China and uh, according to the WSJ, China plans a new spending drive and more stimulus to revive its economy um, with a ton of new infrastructure spending in the pipeline. Um, a bit of that might already be underway because a China state planner said they approved 14 fixed asset investment projects worth a total of 288.8 billion won in May. Uh, and they're going to look to speed up the implementation of key projects and push forward major infrastructure projects in energy, water and transport. Um, so all still kicking on there um, regarding trying to stir up the economy. Um, we know we've had all these rate cuts this week, MLF, LPR, so on and so forth, deposit rates. Um, the Securities Times was quoting a Chinese analyst um, saying that the LPR is expected to be lowered further and it could be uh, a bigger hike, a bigger hike, a bigger cut of around 15 basis points versus the 10 pips uh, we had from all the prior rate cuts. Um, I think we're probably at the point where we're getting close to maybe hearing about an RRR cut, which uh, is is the big one, really, because um, that releases a ton of cash out of banks' uh, reserves. Um, I, perhaps we should be on watch for a bit of a weekend drop of that rate, um, news of that, or at least early Monday morning. Um, I think it could be coming, and that's something that usually moves currencies like the Aussie dollar Um so keep an eye on that uh, Sunday night, early Monday morning. Uh, I just got a feeling in my water we've got uh, one of those coming on the way. Um, although they may wait until they've cut some of these other little rates a bit more. But uh, we'll wait and see. Um, over in Japan, and uh, we start off with the government. And the opposition party has apparently filed a no-confidence motion for the cabinet. Um, cabinet now has, uh, I believe, 16 days to decide what they want to do, whether they reject it. Um, obviously, Kishida can dissolve the House and move to a snap election, which he pretty much ruled out yesterday, but things can change. So that's still bubbling under the surface there. Probably not too much market moving um, because it's likely uh, that he'll, he'll win any election um, pretty clearly. Um, but it just depends on what happens with the opposition, whether they actually lose seats and other parties come into power. There's a whole lot of politics going on over there with the opposition parties. Anyway, we'll keep uh, an eye on that one um, as it continues. Yeah, go on, mate. Ryan, the, the no confidence motion um, is, a, 
He's apparently already voted down. Yeah, we we had something uh, earlier today around eight o'clock. Oh really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably it's been uh, kicked. Sorry. It's already been kicked then, yeah? Yeah, it's, all, it's already been kicked, mate. Uh, okay. Yeah, move on. I'll screw that one up and throw it in the bin. Um, before the, the Bank of Japan, uh, Finance Minister Suzuki was out saying that they, with no comment on FX levels uh, and the usual waffle that uh, FX needs to move in line with fundamentals, blah, 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 blah. Uh, no change to the comments there. Uh, and thus we got the Bank of Japan, which uh, was a bit of a dud in terms of monetary policy and uh, any lines coming out, uh, so unchanged as expected. Um, now, Ueda, I'm going to compare him to someone who likes to play a prank with uh, sticking a five pound note on the street tied to a bit of string. And as soon as someone goes to pick it up, he pulls it away from them. So his comment started off saying expect CPI to slow towards the middle of uh, fiscal year 2023. And there's more time needed to meet the BOJ's 2% inflation target. Um, so keeping on the easing path and the Dovish side there. Um, then said expects wages to rise much more than last year. So offering a little bit of a crumb in terms of what might drive inflation. Um, said we'll continue to weigh the costs and benefits of YCC, keeping on the Dovish side. Then he did this little uh, drop the fiver on the string, saying some degree of surprise could be unavoidable, um, hinting that if they were going to change policy, they may not be able to keep it all slowly, slowly, and uh, there may be some surprise for the market. Um, then he pulled the string by saying the price forecast above 2% may not lead to a policy shift. So another dovish slant. Um, then he said a big possible shift in the price view could lead to a policy change. And there's the fiver going down again. Um, then he pulled it away again by saying today's policy impact um, will appear in a half year or later meaning that uh, what they've done today, i.e. nothing, uh, potentially means that uh, it won't impact monetary policy or won't impact the economy, prices or anything like that for another six months or more. Um, a hint that uh, they're not ready to change just yet. So some little crumbs about uh, if they need to change policy, but otherwise all unchanged, continue easing and not even a real hint of uh, when they might look to exit. Um, your thoughts? Uh, I'll take K first on that one. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I was up for the Bank of Japan. Um, so uh, yesterday, I, I prepared such a really nice uh, little uh, roundup of all the possible uh, possibilities, and he just uh, stuck to uh, possibility one. That means no change at all. And then he spent an hour, um, an hour pushing back against uh, monetary policy changes, and two lines saying that perhaps this or perhaps that. The um, the uh, uh, the other line that stood out for me is that he says that inflation has not yet uh, or is not yet sustainable, and they still expect it to come back down in the latter uh, part of the, the the fiscal year. Um, he's 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 not only an overcommunicator. Um, he he is just a Kuroda before uh, before any of. Uh, any of Kuroda's little surprises. He's, he, he, I've, listening to him, um, it would be a real surprise if 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 they do something without pre-announcing it. That's what I've been saying already. He's, he looks to be an over-communicator and um, seemingly he's not ready yet. And I've got this, I, I can't keep away from this thought where um, at the start he um, Suzuki, Kishida, they were meeting and saying they will cooperate. And it looks to me like Bank of Japan now under Ueda, at least for the start of this fiscal year, is um, is just going to let the government uh, finance all those stimulus packages at uh, at very low rates. And um, he, at least he's, uh, he's not going to help the yen at all for the foreseeable future. Um, yeah. So that, that's about it, mate. I mean, um, there was a possibility, but we will we we still have minutes to come out later, right? Um, I mean, in yeah. in a while, I don't know exactly when. In a couple of weeks, so they could have talked about something. But um, so far, what he uh, um, brings through is absolutely zero for now. Zero, absolutely zero. 
Yeah, ne next week's going to be the first test of uh, this meeting because uh, next Friday we get the next CPI data from Japan. So we'll get to see if inflation is uh, ticking back. Core numbers expected to fall to 3.1% from 3.4%. Uh, but it surprised, I think, to the upside every report for the last few months. So we'll see uh, whether he's right or wrong in that one. If, if there is a jump in uh, CPI next week, um, that's going to throw uh, some hawkish doubt on what he said this week. So that's one to keep an eye on next week. Um, Michael, were you up for the uh, Bank of Japan this morning? Was I was I up for the Bank of Japan? You know I wasn't going to be up for the for the BOJ this morning. Um, obviously had a, a, a read through of, of the decision. Um, you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm not really sure why I bothered because it didn't particularly tell us anything that we didn't know already. Um, and, and as you rightly say, the, the press conference was uh, rather dull as well. Um, I, I think it just reinforces the idea, to be honest, that the the BOJ are a long, long way from considering tightening policy. Um, you know, they are going to keep going with this negative rate, yield curve control and all the rest of it for, for some time to come. And in that sort of environment where, you and I'm sure we'll get onto this a little later on, you know, we had a, a pretty hawkish Fed decision earlier in the week, the ECB continuing to raise rates, the BOE next week. You know, you know why why would the yen find any sort of relief when there's scant sign that the the boj are, are prepared to even start thinking about talking about potentially doing something in terms of tweaking their guidance yeah no, i absolutely agree with that mate um although we've been there's been some little language changes and i i, I would have thought we may have got a little or a few more crumbs towards that but uh it seems to have gone the other way again so yeah. we continue to wait and uh, he made, yeah, go he made things worse at one stage, actually, during the meeting, yeah. saying that the side effects of YCC are more subdued now. I mean, that that actually is, is even more dovish than, uh, yeah. than they were before. And about the wages, uh, rising wages, I mean, uh, no one... No one should be surprised about that because last year they were uh, they were negative and very negative the real wages and this year they got three point eight percent pay rise so the the nominal wages are are going up a little so he 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 did not give us anything new there either right yeah and the problem is we've got to wait another year until we get the next round of wage uh, yeah. talks. And yeah, the, so. yeah, the the one in, the one interesting thing, and I don't know when they come out. Then the next round is going to show the majors for wages for May. Uh, they didn't show really in uh, in in April those uh, those uh, increases, but uh, the May numbers may uh, may show uh, a bit more of it. So that may be a bit of interest. But in the in the meantime, I think we all agree that uh, he's not supporting the yen at all. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, right, well, let's move on. Uh, before we get to the ECB, we'll just uh, run over the data from yesterday from the US. Not really anything much to crow about on either side. Um, we had uh, the Empire State Manufacturing, retail sales, uh, Philly Fed, um, and really, as I say, jobless claims, perhaps the bit of a surprise. I was expected to dip to 250, but came out unchanged as last month, 262. Um, up at the highish end of the 200s, um, not really flagging any major problems. If we start seeing stuff, uh, as Blake mentioned, over 300k, uh, then we're potentially looking at uh, some problems in the jobs market. Uh, but nothing much to talk about there. Empire Manufacturing, a bit of an improvement. Uh, was expected to carry on being negative, but actually went a positive. This one's been a bit flip floppy of late, um, but a small up on that one. Uh, Philly Fed um, was a bit worse than expected. Um, so as you can see, mixed numbers, one up, one down among the regional so far. Um, in the uh, different components, again, not really much to look at. Employment was negative, but not as much. New orders, negative, but not as much. Prices paid up a little bit. So, you know, nothing up, nothing hugely down. Bit of par for the course, what we've seen from the data. Again, with retail sales um, coming in 0.3, you know, not busting any big numbers, um, but was expected to drop. Core numbers up 0.2. Um, we're all looking 0 points, 0 points, 0 points, um, which keeps things ticking over without doing anything uh, really good or really bad. Um, so we can skip over the rest of that data. Um, and uh, let's get into the ECB then. Well, 
pretty much went as expected, um, coming out with a 25 pip hike um, and keeping a hawkish bias overall. Um, the main thing that happened uh, was that they raised CPI forecasts, all their CPI forecasts, but only by a pip. Um, now, why is that surprising? Well, in March, they actually lowered their CPI forecasts um, from December, even while um, core inflation was continuing to rise. Headline inflation had been coming down. I think it was from 9.2% um, in December when those deck forecasts were to uh, 6.1, I think it was, when the March forecast came out. So they lowered all bar one of their forecasts then. Um, we've seen nothing but inflation coming lower since then, um, although the core is still sticky, and they actually raised those forecasts. Um, as I explained yesterday in our chat room, that's their version of, of the dots. That's their higher for longer message. Raising forecasts by a pip doesn't do anything. Um, we see in swings of, of half points, eight points, you know, nearly 100 points in CPI numbers these days. So moving them up a pip isn't a big move. But it is a message. It's a message the ECB are saying we expect inflation to be sticky and that's the reason why we're going to stay hawkish. And that came out in the comments thereafter. Um, the guard said manufacturing continues to weaken and services remain resilient. That's acknowledging what we've been talking about uh, for the last few weeks. The labour market remains a source of strength. Wage pressures increasingly important for the inflation source. Um, and longer term inflation expectations warrant monitoring. Um, then she got into the real nitty gritty saying we still have ground to cover. Uh, um, she said, are we done? She replied, no. Um, then she said, we will likely increase in July. So firmly keep in July in the mix. Um, no, no sign of reversing at all at the moment. And September's uh, on the table as well. Um, now, one thing she did say that stuck out, uh, and she's been mentioning this in, in previous press conferences about the energy support that states are giving. And she said states should roll back energy help or risk further medium term price pressures. Um, now, that's a bit of a repeat, but it came with a note or uh, on the end saying that uh, if there were medium term price pressures, that would call for a stronger monetary policy response. So she's basically saying to member states, if you don't start pulling back on the energy help you're giving people, you're going to create in inflation. That's going to cause us to raise rates more. Um, so a little bit of a, a laying at the feet of governments on that side. Um, she said, barring any material change, it's very likely that we will continue to raise rates in July. We are not thinking about pausing. We haven't discussed or thought about skipping or pausing. And then in another uh, Another wagging finger at the doves. She says, I do not want to comment on a terminal rate. Um, that's for markets. Uh, and the reason she said that was because if she puts a number on a terminal rate, that gives the doves something to target. Because if they know how high we're going to get to, they can start trying the old pivot trades again and when rates are going to start coming down. So throughout all of that, um, hawkish, stay in the line, not yet ready to pause in any way, shape or form. We likely get in a July hike. September is well on the table. Um, we've had a few ECB bods out this morning talking along the same lines. Um, so as far as the market's concerned, the ECB is going to continue. Um, now, after that, we got the usual sources piece and one of those included September and a uh, Reuters piece saying that the ECB are set for a summer debate over a possible September rate hike. Um, and then later on in the evening, we got uh, another interesting story, um, again from Reuters, saying that ECB policymakers uh, are beginning a debate on evening out the interest rate corridor. Um, just to tell you what that is, the ECB has three interest rates. Deposit rate, which is at 3.5%, the main refinancing rate, which is at 4%, and the marginal lending facility, which is at 4.25%. Um, now, up until 2014, all these rates were the same level um, because of the ECB and what they wanted to do with uh, easing policy and injecting money and all that sort of thing. They split the rates up into different bands. These all have different durations of um, 
duration as to which uh, money can be parked at the ECB and whatnot. So what they're looking to do is narrow the corridor between 4.25 and 3.5 percent. I'm assuming that uh, that ratio remains the same going forward. That can be seen in two ways. A hawkish move in narrowing that corridor would be taking the lowest rate up towards the highest rate. Uh, therefore, you're keeping a higher rate in place. A less hawkish move would be doing the opposite, taking the highest rate down towards the lowest rate. So this is something potentially we have to look forward to. Uh, maybe when they get near their peak rates, if they don't change things sooner, um, that could be a last hawkish throw of the dice if they take the lower rates, i.e. the deposit rate, up towards the marginal lending facility, because um, that's then potentially pushing rates a bit higher um, than they are now. That's the ECB. Over to you guys. Who wants uh, who wants to have their ten pence worth first? I'll let our guests do first. But just on on, on this quick uh, on on this ECB corridor thing, I've read the article as well, and it does look to me like they are perhaps a little worried about um, not reserves but uh, scarcity. So reading through the article, it could mean that the higher rate is coming down, or we converge more towards like the middle point, but I don't think they will use it as a hawkish, uh, um, that, that's my two cents only, you know, uh, but I don't think it's 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 meant to read in a, in a hawkish uh, direction because they were talking about the scarcity and, uh, and the rates now being higher. It's probably not uh, needed that you keep uh, rates um, um, as high on the tops on the top end. Um, that, that is how I read it anyway, but then uh, Mr. Mike, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say, it's an interesting one. I, I hadn't actually read that story um, myself, but but it's something that, you know, hasn't really been on, on anyone's mind in terms of narrowing that rate corridor. I, I certainly haven't seen uh, much discuss, discussion about that uh, over the last few weeks and months. So it's, it's interesting that that's suddenly um, been planted in the press. Um, I think the ECB more broadly is is very much in keeping with, well, certainly what Ryan and I were, were discussing earlier in the week, where, you know, the real interest with the ECB comes in September. Um, Lagarde didn't pre-commit to a, a July move, but pretty much guided as as concretely as they're, they're ever really going to, that, that we're going to get another 25 basis point hike then. Um, and it's really then a question of do they go again in in September and I think you're already starting to see this kind of tug of war or this battle between some of the hawks and doves playing out now and we've got three more months of this to go because we've had a lot of ECB speakers already this morning, you know, as you would expect the the German central bank president say, you know, very hawkish putting a, a September uh, hike on the table. Some of the others are a little bit more dovish, a little bit more cautious, um, saying that it's far too early to, to have that conversation. And I'm still very much of the view that we'll probably end up in a, in a place where if we get a, a September hike, and it, it, it feels silly to be talking about this, given the, the sheer volume of data that we've got coming between now and then, but this is the narrative that, that the market's going to be trading. I think there's really two ways a September meeting can go. Either we get a hike, and it's a very, very dovish hike from the ECB, or we get um, a pause or a skip or an end to the hiking cycle, whatever you want to call it, but that comes with some concessions for the Hawks and it's, you know, around the balance sheet rundown or, or something like that. But, you know, in terms of what the ECB announced yesterday, probably not too surprising. I'm not entirely sure there was much in there to make the Euro rally a whole big figure. Um, but there we are, you know, the, the market is not necessarily a, a logical beast at all times, but certainly I think the, the ECB are, are getting towards the end of the, the tightening cycle. I think, um, We've probably got one, maybe two more hikes in the tank at the the very, very most. Yeah, exactly, mate. Exactly. Um, I mean, I, I'm not surprised to see the euro up here. Um, I just had that feeling yesterday, all through the ECB and and seeing how it came through the, the Fed and everything else, and it just it just looked like it wanted to go. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't in it. Uh, that's the worst part of it. Um, I was looking for a decent dip uh, over the Fed and the, the CPI data to get some on, but I didn't, and I don't like chasing. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised to see it. I, it but there was a very high bar to see the dollar rally in any way, shape, or form this week. And 
you know, apart from dollar yen, that's that's been the case, but that's been more yen than uh, dollar. So I'm not surprised to see that. Uh, anyway, Kay, your thoughts on the ECB? Well, first of all, I must say I was half wrong because um, I thought Lagarde would start to um, shed a little bit of her hawk uh, wings um, over the over the presser. So that hasn't materialized at all. And that I think is part of your big figure higher in the, in, in the euro dollar uh, after the event. Um, yeah, so the rest of the expectations were pretty much there. I mean, the hike and leaving the door open, but she didn't only leave the door open, she, she nearly pinned the, 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 well, she did actually pin the, the July hike uh, on there too. So uh, in that respect, I think the market was perhaps a little bit hopeful or speculating that she may start to uh, be more uh, neutral or uh, picking up the dovish, uh, not necessarily dovish, but more neutral because she has been in the Hawks camp uh, now for a good few months. Um, yeah, so that's where your big figure comes from. So I was, um, to me, it was, let's say, half, half a surprise uh, that, that she actually um, kept her uh, very hawkish tone. Now, um, yeah, so the market uh, took it uh, as uh, we, we had a pause of the Fed. We had uh, the, the ECB hiking and the ECB hiking clearly saying that they are going to continue where the Fed says we don't know. Um, and, and that's also what happened then. I reckon that the market or the maybe the bigger players were waiting for both meetings to be over and to then uh, uh, give the dollar a, a decent a decent slap. Um, and then buying euros as well. But then it's quite funny that apart from yen, the rest of the euro crosses has not really followed. So it, so it was really a dollar move. Well, I mean, euro cat is a bit higher as well. I mean, the, the, the stuff in New York and gas uh, can, can do strange things, but um, it's mostly a dollar move, right? So, and that was, that seems to me that the, the, the people were just waiting for both meetings to be over and then uh, give, give the dollar a slap. Um, and we also saw paradoxi paradoxically, uh, is it how you say it? The, the, the US yields come actually coming, uh, coming off a little bit uh, post meeting. So I, I really reckon it's a, it's a case that people were waiting. And uh, as you say, you were expecting it that the dollar comes off a little bit, but then um, her being so hawkish, I'm that surprised that we don't see more Euro crosses being higher, if you look, for instance, at the euro sterling, um, it's actually low, and um, so that is that is a bit uh, well. I mean, that's Bank of England, of course, in there, and the data in the UK. But we could have expected that after uh, Lagarde, all euro crosses would be higher, but that is not the case. So it's been a dollar move. Yeah, yeah, very much. And I think, uh, yeah, I think it's good. So where where is the end? Of all this then is it september yeah i guess mike uh, mike uh, said it there um july is, is pretty much uh, nailed on and then september is going to be the big uh, big decision time probably yeah so what we're looking at rates what we're looking at rates probably four percent ish four and a quarter depending on on which uh which one we're looking at um is that a fair level do you think for for the ecb i reckon so i mean I reckon so, but I mean, we will see where uh, how sticky inflation will be then, and how those um, those data are moving because we saw a little bit of uh, weakness, especially in the German data coming out over the past weeks, and uh, that's going to be uh, they they should start to 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 look at uh, at those kind of data as well, uh, barring inflation. But for the time being, inflation is still sticky. So yeah, so the, the main interest rate is four percent. We could be looking at four and a half if they do two quarters. Or they could go to four and a quarter next meeting, and then uh, December will be where it's uh, where it's all about. Uh, September, sorry. Yeah. 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 No, I agree with that. Um, Mark and Alice are talking about a peak at four percent. Um, I think that might be the deposit rate. A lot of people tend to look at the deposit rate when they're talking about peaks, Mike. Um, so again, you have to be careful to make sure what rate they're talking about um, because we're already at four percent. Um, in the main rate, and they're thinking of going in July, so we're already above that four percent. But the deposit rate at three and a half would suggest uh, that that's the peak they're talking about um, on that one. 
And then we might play the game of uh, narrowing the corridor or bringing all the rates in line uh, again anyway. So in one shape, way, shape or form, there's going to be a rate hike or a rate cut outside of rate hikes and rate cuts, if that makes sense. Uh, but anyway, we'll deal with that when it happens. Um, so the euro in general, right. we've had this breakup. 109's toast. We had a level at 109, 35, 40. That's toast as well, and it's trying to build support there at the moment. Um, we've got a bit of resistance uh, here around the 130, 109.60s, uh, as you can see there. Just we had some prior action going in along there. Um, the next number for me is the big figure 110, and then if we get up towards these highs, 105. Uh, 110 and a half, 11070, that sort of area. And then we might have a crack at uh, 111. Um, can we do that? Have we got room to move up there? I think I think it, there's a case to say we could have a move up there. Can we break it? That's a different story. If the Fed are on pause uh, for now, uh, and if we get any inclination that July hike isn't going to happen, then I think that's going to give us the legs to run this up to that 111. Um, in between, we're going to be trading the data points. Um, we've got uh, Michigan sentiment uh, later on today. That's about the only US data for the day. Um, not a huge number, but in this environment, just after the Fed, where we're going to be looking to see whether they're going to be right or wrong with a pause, um, this data may be a mover later on. Uh, so keep an eye on that one. Um, the other one, sorry, just, uh, just yeah, to on, jump mate. in there. Now, now that the fire alarm has stopped ringing in the office and I can actually talk again, um, I was going to say the um, the thing with the University of Michigan number for for me is is not necessarily the um, the the actual sentiment figure itself. It's those inflation expectations. Yeah. That that's what's really really worth watching, particularly the um, the five to ten year inflation expectation. Because I think that um, on the last read when when that survey came out in May, I think the the longer run expectation was its um, highest since 2011. Mm. And of course, you know that that. That is the the problem now for policymakers. It's you know you there, there's signs at least in the states, not necessarily here, but at least in the states that um, inflation is starting to, to move lower. Um, the problem is, do we now get to a situation where those longer term expectations have have risen to such a degree that you end up with these price pressures almost getting embedded within the economy and and i think that's going to be something very very important to watch as we uh, as we move through and and debate whether or not the fed are going to be pausing in july hiking in july skipping again whatever it may be yeah mike i i, I think michael you're you're absolutely right uh, in in that the um, we we had a couple of few months there um, around the turn of the year where the, where these more the longer term inflation expectations went below three percent, and now it's the second or third time that they are above three percent again and actually increased by it's 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 again ten basis points but uh, it's it's not a lot but it, that those kind of expectations may indeed play a role right yeah. Yeah, agreed. And Mike's just asked, do we see, can we see Euro dollar oh reaching 112? <laughs> so well, can we just discuss your chart first, Ryan? Oh, pot kettle, mister. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about my chart, Sonny Jim. And, you're, and, you're, and, you're, and you haven't of, seen anything yet. There's a few specialists in our chat room who have worked much worse than that. <laughs> yeah, even even Kay, even Kay used to take the mick out of my charts, and he's overtaken me with the colours. So, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Calm down, <laughs> calm down. It's Friday. Calm down. You'll see them in a minute. You'll see them in a minute. Anyway, enough about my charts. Thank you very much. Um, One twelve. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of goings on on the dollar side uh, rather than the euro side. But you never know. You know, you could see inflation accelerating in eurozone data picking up. Um, I don't see it i think 111 is going to be a decent enough level um you know you can see it there it goes all the way back to last year so you know 112 is a big level as well um you know we had a break there and uh, it became solid resistance so th these are these are big levels we're getting into um the question is you know we're talking 25 pip hikes here or there have the ecb got two more in them have the fed got one more in them you know 25 pip hikes aren't you know, worthy two, three hundred pips um, or anything like that. So it's gonna it's gonna take some work 
to bust up through these levels uh, in the euro. And as I say, I think that's going to come on probably a weaker dollar rather than a stronger euro. Um, so it's all going to be led by what goes on uh, in the Fed. And of course, as we've been mentioning for weeks and weeks, the next big trade we're going to be playing with or expectations is when they start cutting. Um, and then we're going to play the central bank monetary policy divergence the opposite way. Who's coming down fastest? Who's going to get to neutral fastest? Where's neutral going to be? Um, we've got all that to come. And I think we're probably going to be playing that, start playing that uh, in the latter part of this year. So we've got, we've got a while, but we can get positioned. Um, if you want 112, you got to get through 111. If you can't get through 111, what are you going to do with that? Um, you're going to keep buying it up at 111, hoping for 112. Um, are you going to think, well, we've got a solid level here, so maybe try the other way and see if we find a bit of a range, you know, maybe down back down to the 108s, 107s, uh, something like that. Um, just to show you a clean chart, um, we are messing around with a bit of a trend line that's uh, been a bit of an on-off trend line that goes all the way back to 2017. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on just for this, because if we get a move above it and we manage to hold it, it could find it's a bit of a level of support and then we might get a, a further move up. Um, so it's a bit of a longer term chart to look at. Um, going to look at Euro Sterling because this is one I did want to play between uh, over the ECB and managed to get some in, although <sighs> didn't give us much of a jump. I was I was looking, hoping uh, we might get a look up at 86, even as a bit higher. Um, I would have loved anything up to 87, 86.50, that sort of area. I would have jumped all over that. Um, but in the end, I just had to take some. I got in at 76 and a bit more at uh, a bit higher up, 85s, I think it was. Um, Kay, you got in some of this as well. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't get the rally like we did in the Euro, dollar, did we? I, I, was, I was honestly thinking, listening to, to Lagarde, she went on. That we would go up to eighty six and a half. I, I really was was thinking that we could get there. So that I'm, I've only sold small up there on that on on that rally, thinking that uh, give me eighty six and a half and I and I'll give it a good kick in the ghoulies, But uh, never never been up there. So uh, yeah, we have to take what's uh, what's given. Yeah, what's in front of us. You know, um, have to do it with the smalls sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Now as I was saying, sixty eight and. Uh... 85s I got in at yesterday. Um, oh. I just had to put some on. Yeah. I had FOMO from uh, missing everything else this week, so I had to chuck it on. But we need to get through this 3540 area. Um, and I'm, and I'm sure I'm, I'm sure you you you're going to ask, but uh, I and I just wanted to have like uh, Mike's view on on what's going on in Sterling, and not only um, price wise and expectations for the Bank of England. But do, while uh, Mike's here, do you have any opinion also about anything that could affect um, the sterling, perhaps more on the political side with, with, with Sunak, Bojo and stuff uh, going on? Is, do you have any expectations uh, around that as well? It can, can be only like a one minute uh, if you just say no, that's fine as well with me. But uh, so, I mean, a, a bit of an overview if you can, if you if you would have. Oh dear, you're going to regret asking me about the UK and keeping <laughs> yeah, it within a minute thought. is going to be a, a, a problem, I think. Um, okay. let, let's do it. <laughs> start the clock. Um, let's do it quickly. Um, politics, I don't think it's a story yet. Um, obviously, we are, as we all know, probably 18 months, two years away from a, a, an election here in the UK. We've, we've got to have one by uh, January of, of 2025, uh, probably in autumn next year. So the, the, Sterling doesn't care about politics at the moment. It, it will, I'm sure, as we, we move nearer to um, that eventual election. But certainly at the moment, that, that's not really a feature. I think that's just noise. Um, as you said, Sterling's had a, an incredible rally this week. The, 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 the long-standing resistance, if you look at cable 126.80, we've blown through that and, and haven't looked back. And if you look at the charts, I'm sure Ryan's got a chart with a million lines on it. One of them will uh, will show that there's not really much in, in the way of levels between here and 130. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we, we could really start to, to push higher just on a pure momentum play. 
I don't think, though, that if you look at what the rally's built on, personally, and I know I've been the most bearish man in the world on the UK for some time now, mm. you know, the, the market, is, as someone popped in the chat a second ago, is pricing in a, roughly a coin flip that the BOE get 6% mm. in terms of bank rate. Um, that that I, I cannot see that happening. Um, you know, if they're going to raise rates by 25 basis point clips, that means they're going to hike all the way through until February of 2024, which, mm. you know, quite frankly, the, the economy is going to have headed south a long time before then. Um, so I think the, the market's going to be disappointed in terms of its, its BOE expectations. You've got a labor market that's far too tight, inflation that's running far too hot, and almost absolutely no economic growth. I think we, we saw uh, an expansion of about two tenths of 1% in April. We'll give all of that up in May because of the extra bank holiday. Um, there's just really not a lot going for the UK at the okay. moment. But at the same time, would I would I short cable? If you'd asked me this time last week, then yes, absolutely. And I'd probably now be, be crying in a corner somewhere. Um, would I do it now? It's a bit of a tougher case to make, given that that you know we're we're in this kind of technical no man's land almost. Yeah, and there is momentum uh, behind uh, the sterling right now. Yeah, exactly. I, I do think though, if you look at uh, the way cable behaved, so there's a there's a partial dollar uh, playing there as well. We're seeing across the board, but the the way the the, the reason why euro sterling as well is lower is is this, there is a bit of positive divergence, I would say, in the in the real data uh, compared to to European or compared to other. Uh, parts of the world as well, which uh, which are supportive for the study right now, and and well, people listening in here and people in our room, know I'm I'm been quite positive on sterling for for a good while. Um, I, I do think it's it's supported not only by uh, Bank of England expectations, but also what the, what the data are showing us now. The the the, the million dollar question is, of course, uh, is it going to last? But as you say, and uh, uh, Stella actually as well was talking about that. There's this little standing in the way for to print the 130 on the cable, perhaps even into uh, into next week uh, until the next CPI print. Because imagine next Wednesday CPI comes in a percent lower, then uh, it's uh, turn that ship around. I'd say. Yeah, I, I personally think there's a fat chance of that happening with the CPI. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It may come down. Uh, probably will come down. I wouldn't be surprised if. Uh, we saw some uh, upside numbers in that as well, the way inflation's been going. There, there really is no let up over here in what's going on with, with prices at the moment, particularly food inflation. Yeah. Um, so oh, sorry. I was just going to say on, no, on inflation, you forget the headline number. Um, you know, that that is just going to keep coming lower and lower and lower, but it's all mechanical. It's all because of the slightly wonky way that we set energy prices here in the UK. Um, and also due to the pretty tough annual comps from last year, that, that base effect is going to drag things lower. So what we really need to start looking at is, well, firstly, the core number. So you take out energy and you, you take out food. Um, that is at a 30-year high of 6.7% of and doesn't seem to be showing any sign of wanting to come lower anytime soon. Um, and the other thing is you start looking at things like uh, annualizing the month-on-month -month prints or the, the three-month average or whatever it may be. Um, and that's how you get a kind of truer read on on what inflation is is really doing. Um, but I don't think any of it is, uh, is going to be particularly good news. Let's put it that way. Yeah, well, at core inflation, I'm just looking at it now, core inflation is expected to dip to 6.7 from 6.8 uh, and headline to 8.5 from 8.7. Oh, there we um, go. Let's pop the champagne. Yeah, pop. <laughs> both measures are expected to come down, but, you know, I think it's a coin flip whether it comes down, uh, stays the same or goes up again. Um, I certainly don't expect to see a big drop more than expected on, on those numbers. And what Mike's failed to uh, drop into the conversation is that the likelihood of uh, him buying me lunch when the BOE hits 5%. I know he's uh, kept oh, a quiet on that one. I have. Bit I time have. Ago. <laughs> I'm, st I'm still feeling yesterday's lunch. I can't think about buying you lunch. <laughs> and and uh, it's not going to be a McDonald's lunch, I'll give you that. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, Kay, do you want to have uh, a quick look around? I know you want to... Uh, show everyone uh, you had a great trade in that uh, guppy and uh, what's uh, expected next so I yeah thanks mate um i'm just going to um 
Yeah, show perhaps a few of those uh, of those yen pairs since we had uh, since we had Bank of Japan on, right? Um, and and I'll have a look at, uh, at at sterling perhaps as well. Um, so yeah, first of all, you know this um, this sterling yen. Um, we came very close here to uh, the seventy eight point six of the whole move lower from uh, from twenty where well, we came there actually we pinned it. Um, from the yeah 2015 all the way down to 2020 move um, there, and then in the shorter term as well, um, we had um, some activity up here as well, and that's why I decided to take uh, this trade off. Um, I've been on and off in this trade from uh, around uh, here actually low 70, so that's a uh, um, I, I think I missed a big figure on the way up, but the rest, uh, the rest was pretty okay. Um, and I decided to take it off today because I had what I wanted to see from the Bank of Japan, and then we had this uh, this acceleration, and uh, it's a pretty decent target. And if we look at uh, at back in time, it's a pretty decent uh, target. Now, um, some of us in the room. And also in the market are looking at this uh, kind of extension. If you look at it from a technical point of view, there is also, um, did it, is this on the weekly or so? Yeah, there's also a possibility that we are going to tag before um, inflation comes out next week. There is a possibility we are going to tag this 184 as well, which is the 50% of the whole um, global financial crisis, plus a bit of European crisis weighing on the, uh, on, on all the end pairs and uh, including the sterling because then we were still in uh, in, in Europe uh, as one can remember until here. Um, so this, there's a few really decent levels on uh, on the horizon in this uh, sterling yen. Can it break? Of course. I mean, technicals are just what they are, pictures. And uh, the market decides what to do with a pair um, just because there are more buyers than sellers or uh, or vice versa. But to me, that was a decent enough target to uh, reassess a little bit um, and uh, and see what's going to happen next. So that is me done for that trade for now. And I don't know for how long, because if we really start to, um, or if we get a decent setback um, towards the end of the week or, or today or, um, Early next week, I may I may decide to 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 re-enter it because let's face it, I mean Ueda is not giving um, the dollar bulls anything at all, right? Anything at all. And um, but if we look at the dollar yen as well, and uh, we we are close to uh, here a um, the upper trend line of this uh, channel or wedge, whatever you however you may call it. And we are running into interesting zones here, as, uh, levels here as well, um, up in the 142s. There, I, I well, I'm, I'm just playing around. Really, um, earlier this week, I bought a, I bought a call when when Dolian was around 139. I bought a 140 call, and I've been trading my my option around. I mean, both on um, both on the ECB and on the and on the uh, and on the Bank of Japan. I tried a, a long dollar via um via option so um, um people in the room know that on, on the euro dollar I, I bought a bit of a put but that was like just at 20 points uh 20 points risk which is okay uh, but the dollar yen has been uh, pretty good because since it's broke above 140 we haven't really uh, looked back uh, too much so i'm trading this around and i will respect levels up to 142 142 and a half versus my uh, my call because also we can't deny that the um, the dollar itself is is not doing uh, doing too well right now. So um, in the longer term, can we go higher? Of course we can go higher um, because the radar says uh, not to buy uh, not to buy yen right now. Um, is it going to go straight away? That's going to be depending on the dollar. And today. And that's why I hedged quite a bit of my option now. I'm over half hedged today um, on those Michigan data. If we get any weakness and looking at how the market's been trading the dollar this week, um, it may be that uh, that the dollar um, could have a tough time um, finishing the week. 
So here we are um, on the cable. Also earlier, um, we've broken uh, above this uh, this line here. Well, uh, the 126, 50, 80 as well. Uh, but we we're we're breaking up, and there's very little reason to uh, to be really short. We are um, we're even going breaking above uh, the uh, 61.8 here. So um, cable is a bit of an animal right now, and I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't look for a reversal for as long as we're above 126.15.60. Really, this zone here should be uh, should be support uh, right now. And uh, as we were talking about, there's uh, not too much standing in the way of uh, having a look at a uh, 1.30. For that, we will need some more um, weak US data, and that could be the accelerator um, for uh, for this move. And then. You know, 200 points in cable. Cable is a faster mover usually than uh, than the euro. Um, it's it could be a matter of uh, of a couple of days. You know, we could be there even before um, the the next uh, round of CPI data comes out next Wednesday. Wednesday. So be a tad careful if you want to counter trade this cable. I'd rather wait for it to start moving lower than uh, than going to stand in front of it uh, right here and now. To be honest, um, yeah, Ryan already showed that that euro sterling a little bit different look. This this still looks to me like we're uh, we could, you could put a bit of a line here as well. Still looks offered. I was hoping <laughs> that that it would break a little bit above this zone, go into the uh, 86 and a half, and then and then come back lower. Uh, kind of a false break of this uh, trend line. We even didn't get it. We had to uh, be satisfied with just. A very very shy test of the uh, of the upper line here, very very shy, um, and and it's already back down. Um, it's probably going to be a slow grind lower if it has to go because um, Lagarde was uh, was hawkish enough um, to hold this one from falling out a bit, but I still think it's uh, it's oriented a little bit lower down to low eighty uh, fives, and then we will have uh, we will see what. Um, what goes on in this one? Uh, what else? We got a couple of interesting uh, levels also on the commodity currencies. Have a look at this: sixty-eight ninety on the Aussie, tagged it, and uh, well, went like a couple of points through, but um, tagged it and 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 really um, capped right now. So this is going to be your level for this afternoon, I think, when the uh, Michigan comes out. On the Aussie, um, we did have that surprise rate hike. Uh, Aussie did, uh, did very well since then, um, and um, yeah, so that's the level to to look out for. 68, 30, 35, and then 68, call it 0515 is going to be your zone. The prior high here as well. If that starts to go, that means that something. Say, uh, has told us that uh, it's no time to be uh, to be short dollars anymore. So I'll I'll look uh, I'll look for that lower zone here actually um, after the um, to end the week or after the uh, the Michigan. Um, we've got similar on picture on Kiwi. Kiwi is trying to make up its mind around the sixty one point eight here, sixty two thirty thirty five. Had already several tries to break above, and we're hanging around. I guess that's going to be your level to um, to monitor for the end of the week and start of next. If we hold it, if we get get above and hold it, um, we should be on our way to 62 three quarter, perhaps 63 the figure. Yeah, 63 the figure is is pretty reasonable. Have a look at what's uh, uh, the the prior top here before the big uh, the big decline. So if we uh, hold above, this could be uh, the target around 63. Um, on the other side, if we start to turn around again, then we are going to talk about our famous uh, 61, uh, 85, 95 again, or 61, 85 figure, where we uh, always had a bit of interest in the past as well around there. Um, so that's going to be your level to the downside. What else? What else? What else? What else? Um, Noki. It's a bit of a strange one. I thought that we sh at least should come and test those this this uh, support here, or and and that later springboard um, for the last leg higher. But we can't get down there. Probably has to do with oil and gas. 
uh, as well. And, and Norges Bank is still selling Norwegian Kroner every day, at least until the end of this month. I was hoping for a little bit of a test here, a serious test to make a decision on this uh, on this Norwegian Kroner. But for now, it's um, undecisive. I, I, I'd buy a, a, I'd catch a knife here, but it's, it's re really undecided. On the top side, if uh, if we get another test here of those low 1170s and fail, then I think we there's, there could be more to come, but we may have to wait. Next week is Norges Bank, by the way, and some of the Scandinavian banks are thinking that they may go as far as a 50 BP hike, which is not in their playbook, but they may do it because their inflation was very, very sticky in, uh, in, in Norway. Um, dollar Noki, for those who trade dollars, we are on support here. Um, 10.47, 10.50. Keep an eye on that for the for the close of the week. Keep an eye also if we would get a retest of 65.68. What's happening there? Um, if we break under this uh, under this zone, then we probably on our way to a lower 10 and a quarter or so in the dollar Norway. But I've, I've got little little of a view here. Um, and the thing I was talking about yesterday. Um, are those uh, emerging market uh, emerging market crosses? It does look like some of um, the carry traders got a little bit a uh, little bit cold there, and we saw this spike in euro mix. Um, keep an eye on what's happening around 1870, 72 at the close of the week. The longer termers they are still pretty much sleeping on both ears. Those who have been short taking the carry for a long time, they've they've had a really a double double push. Not only it, did it come lower, but every day they're getting money. Same could be said about the mix yet, of course, even more. Um, but even on 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 the euro mix, I don't think the long termers will be worried for as long as this stays below 1940, 1950 or so, because they 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 have been taking a lot of carry uh, so far. But for the short termers. These 1870-72 could be uh, interesting enough for the end of the week. So hold it, then we may start to push up in the high 18s, possibly low uh, low 19s. If in turn we start to lose it again, um, the mix is still very popular, as we know. Uh, if we start to lose it again, then uh, we're probably going to go back to uh, to retest the lows. I think that's good enough for now, uh, Ryan. Back to you. Thank you very much, mate. I'm just going to grab the screens back very quickly before we finish up. Um, can you see those okay? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so for all you loony lovers, and this is a this is also a lesson if you want to be trying to pick tops in cable. Um, we had this breakdown. Um, I'm I'm a little long down into here, 37s and uh, 13s. If you want to try and pick bottoms and pick tops, this is the sort of price action that gives you a bit of hope. You make a low. You bounce, you come back to that low, you hold it. Um, you know, we may break down in this one. Uh, and if we do break down, I think we're probably going to see uh, the next big level down at 3080, which is another big level. Um, we've got a lot of empty space here. But if you want to try and do the same in cable and pick some tops, look for confirmed price action. So in cable, we've had a high now up here. If we test that high and hold it, that, that gives you a bit of a signal to try some shorts. Uh, if we break that high, even by a few pips, it tells you we're not done. Um, all you want to try and do is stay in the trade as long as possible. Um, so that's that's my play for that one. And just back to uh, Euro Sterling, I'm short this one. I wanted to short uh, Hawkish ECB to run into the Bank of England. I'll be looking for the low 85s to take some profit on that one. Uh, I think if the CPI um, comes in strong, we should probably get that. If the Bank of England is strong after that, we may get that, um, but then that's when I'll start to look to take some profit and lock it in the rest uh, because the market is already starting to get a bit extreme on where rates are going to go uh, for the BOE, as uh, one of the rumors just said, looking at 6%, some people, Mike said. So, you know, that's probably getting a little bit toppy um, in terms of expectations, and that means that the market's probably pricing that way, and then we can't go much further than that. So down around 85s, 8480s, that's going to be a big level to watch into next week where I'll be looking uh, to take some profits. On that note, thank you very much to our substitute and welcome guest, Michael Brown. Thanks for coming in, mate. Uh, any last thoughts from you uh, on the rest uh, of what's to come today? or uh, The rest of what's to come today? Uh, well, I'm yeah. hoping markets are quiet so we can uh, sit back and watch the cricket, aren't we? Um, 
But uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting week next week. Um, BOE next Thursday, obviously. The other thing that um, I, I don't think has been mentioned is that uh, Fed Chair Powell is making his way to Capitol Hill for some testimony uh, next Wednesday and Thursday, oh, I think right. it is. Um, but well, exactly. It will be like watching paint dry. But I think it could be quite interesting um, just in the context of, you know, since the FOMC, uh, I would argue markets have probably moved in the in the opposite direction to where Powell would have probably wanted them to go. You, you haven't seen uh, Treasury yields manage to sustain that rise. Stocks are a little bit firmer. The dollar's a little bit softer. So the market hasn't really reacted to that hawkish revision to the dot plot. And I just wonder whether Powell is going to really try and, and ram that message home when he speaks on, on Wednesday. Um, and as a result of that, we might uh, perhaps perhaps get uh, a little bit more of a hawkish message there and, and that could inject a, a little bit of vol into things but uh, yeah they're the they're the two things i'd be watching as as we move into next week i don't this is going to be famous last words but given the the lack of any news the lack of data the fact we're going into a long weekend in the u.s as well um and my expectations are, are relatively low for excitement throughout the rest of the day yeah, no, go on to that. And uh, yeah, I didn't want to say it, but I'll be tuning into cricket a bit later as well. Anyway, <laughs> that's all uh, for this week. Uh, a really busy week. I hope you guys and girls have done uh, well with your trading um, and not made any big losses if you haven't. Um, thank you as always to K Man and our thanks to Delios for his input. Thanks to Michael for popping in. Thanks to all you folks for supporting us on the Flow Show. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we shall see you all bright and breezy on Monday. Take care. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everybody. Have a good, safe weekend. And be careful for the witches, okay? Uh, it's witching day today. <laughs> Cheers, gents. Cheers. Hey, traders. This is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.